Welcome to the Rochester, New Hampshire History Podcast, a monthly show that will shine a light on a piece of history that has been all but forgotten. In 1861, at the beginning of the American Civil War, Dr. Ezra Prey was granted a naval surgeon's appointment for the Union Navy. He was born in Rochester in 1832, the son of Ezra and Hannah Prey. Ezra was described in his enrollment record as 5 feet 10 inches tall, light complexion, brown hair, and blue eyes. His first assignment was as a surgeon on the USS Fernandia. The main duty of the Fernandia was to pursue and capture Confederate ships trying to break through the Union blockade. Unlike other Rochester soldiers and sailors who served in the war, Ezra kept a daily diary. The diary has survived and still can be read. Similar to many Civil War diaries, there were daily updates about weather, health, the ship, and duties. Like most sailors on blockade duty, Ezra's life was mostly filled with tedious duties punctuated with excitement. The excitement was usually caused by the ship almost crashing on sandbars from violent storms or from the psychotic ship's captain who thought the crew was in mutiny. Let's take a look at excerpts from the diary. Ezra was a novice when it came to serving on the sea. November 29th. It is now a month since I first reported or saw many new things during this time and exposed my ignorance by asking many foolish questions. The day commenced with a strong wind. Soon there were squalls, and the sea began to get rough. I was sick and could not vomit enough. I thought I should throw up my toenails. Captain Brown, the paymaster, Mr. Hempstead, and the others were sick, so I was not alone. Captain Brown said the ship was a lively little bitch. She took on water in great quantities and leaked. On Christmas, 1861, the USS Fernandia captured a Confederate ship. December 25th, Christmas. At 7.30, the schooner, William H. Northup, was boarded and found to be a prize. She hailed from Nassau, but really from Wilmington, North Carolina, where he wanted to return. Had there been any win, he would have left us very quick. But as fortune would have it, he could not get away from us. The schooner was once used as a pilot boat and was a good sailor. There were only three men besides a rough-looking captain. He came on board, and we all pitied him. He looked so downcast. One of the crew, John Westendorf, a German, volunteered in the service of the U.S. and proves to be a good man. The other two preferred to go to New York in irons. She was loaded with coffee and medicines, the amount of $1,100 only. She had some fruit as well. The capture of the ship seems to have been an exception. Most of the time, the Fernandia did not have the speed to catch the Confederate ships. December 26. We chased two schooners a few hours today, but gave it up. January 22nd. Rain, etc. Chase a sail or two. Cannot catch them. Fresh wind at night. Ezra's opinion of the ship's captain was not good. He questioned his competence and leadership. March 13th. I'm sorry to say that the captain disappointed everyone, almost by his want of fortitude and exemplary coolness. He wrung his hands and exclaimed, We are lost. We shall be taken prisoners, etc. And complained of the officers. All this disgusted us. March 17th. I am surprised the amount of disrespect a crew can show to an officer and he be ignorant of it. When he blusters on deck, all the men below are repeating his expressions of fear. On April 4th, 1862, tensions between the crew and the captain boil over. Slept till between 10 and 11 when someone rapped on my door and said, Doctor, get up. Captain has killed a man. I put on my boots and went on deck to see what was the matter. I there saw some men binding Michael Heaney who, they said, had made a villainous attack upon Captain Brown, who stood by with sword and pistol. Ezra found that the captain had been stabbed in the leg with a knife. Ezra could plainly see that the crew was not rebelling, but merely drunk. Captain came forward, sword and pistol in hand, and declared the crew in an open mutiny. I stepped up to him, in a low voice said, These men are drunk, not mutinous, Captain said. You must be drunk not to see there is a mutiny on board my ship. I was surprised at his remark and stepped back. A drunk crew member named Hillman was being restrained when the captain raised his pistol and shot Hillman in cold blood. Captain Brown stepped up and shot him. The ball from one Colt large revolver entered low down in the abdomen and was found under the skin of his back, which had pushed out so hard that McGuire, whose thigh was against his back, thought himself shot also. Hillman was carried to the cabin where I examined his wounds. While doing so, the captain was raving about mutiny and said I had connived at it. I was mad and repeated what I said about drunkenness and told him if he wanted to report it to the Commodore to report it. Ezra tried to save the life of the sailor who was shot. Unfortunately, he was gut shot, and the most Ezra could do was keep the man comfortable. On April 17th, the ship sailed into Baltimore Harbor 
and Ezra's patient died a day later, while docked in Baltimore, the captain of Ezra's ship was brought before a Navy court. The court ruled there was no mutiny, and the captain was in the wrong for shooting the sailor. Even though he was found at fault, the captain's punishment was minimal. He was reduced in rank and assigned to command another ship. A few days after the death of the sailor, Ezra's journal ran out of pages. I'm getting to the end of my book again, and I will not extend it as before by adding more paper, but rather send it home for my friends to read, who I trust will not lend it around to those outside of two certain families, one my own and the other in Great Falls. I have not the patience to correct my blunders, and they are legion, and therefore hope those who read will pardon such and correct some of them, perhaps. It is a poor scrapbook and does not deserve notice, yet my friends will like to read it, I dare say. I hope the next book of notes will be better worth reading. Now then to all, good night. Ezra was reassigned to several other warships and continued his medical service for the duration of the war. He received an honorable discharge in 1866. Ezra married Martha Hansen and they had two sons. Ezra took up farming in his hometown of Rochester. He died on April 4th, 1918 in Rochester at the age of 86. This ends the podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email bobgriffinpodcast at gmail.com. And come back next month for another episode of Rochester, New Hampshire History.